Students call me Lama Linda and I lead a Vajrayana Buddhist Sangha called Awaken in Toronto. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about trauma-informed Dharma. Now I'm a social worker as well as a Dharma teacher and it's really important to me that we understand what trauma-informed Dharma is all about if we're going to be Dharma teachers in the 21st century. And this all begins with a really clear understanding of the difference between Dharma, which relates to the states of one's being, and trauma, and that's very related to the stages and how one interacts with the world, with other people, and uh, the way that we act. So let's start by talking about what trauma is. Trauma is an upsetting event that is out of your control and that triggers your instinctual brain. This is often called the amphibian brain. Doctors might call it the amygdala. And when this happens, no matter what your age, in chronological age, you no longer act like an adult. So trauma takes one away from, from one's usual functioning and it takes one out of the window of tolerance. So this window of tolerance is a term that's used by Stephen Porges, who has done a lot of research on polyvagal theory. And I'm going to break this down really simply for you, just in terms of the basics of what you need to understand about polyvagal theory. Essentially, it's related to the autonomic nervous system, the one that responds whenever there is a crisis, whenever there is a big upsetting event. And the polyvagal theory um, um, tells us about the vagus nerve. And many of us may never have heard of the vagus nerve. It's just a part of this vast nervous system that um, uh, keeps us running on a day-to-day -day basis. But the vagus nerve connects three main areas. It connects the brain. It connects the lungs, hearts, and th heart and throats. And it also connects the stomach or the gut. And when trauma occurs, it triggers a basic instinctual fear response. This fear response happens in the amygdala. It can't be, um, it can't be stopped. It can't be altered, but it just trips. It just, the fear response happens. And the first thing that a human tries to do when the fear response has been tripped is it 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 goes into a flooding of hyper arousal hyper up energy and this leads to fight or flight now fight as many of you can imagine can include fist fights and actual confrontations but more often in the 21st century it it's about words. It's the angry words we say. It's the it's the way we fight back with words in a conflict, in a fight, in a in a way of getting back uh, some control. Flight, on the other hand, is literally what it sounds like. the The human leaves. You leave the room. You leave the house. You leave the car. You leave the situation. You leave the relationship. But there's an actual exiting, a removal of the physical body from that which causes the fear. And if either of these two work, that's great. The, uh, the being can, can, you know, is flooded with hormones and adrenaline and norepinephrine and numerous other um, sort of chemicals. And yet uh, there's, a, there's a reduction of the fear and one can kind of go back um, to coping. And if those don't work, and maybe one learns this over time because of tra they, tr you know, a, a human a being might try it a couple of times. And if it doesn't work, one then slips into the second um, effort, which is the hypo arousal or energy down. And this is what's known as the freeze. These are the three F's, the fight, the flight, or the freeze. And the freeze is literally uh, not being able to move, could be catatonic, the body just holds still, playing a possum. Um, often when there's a big T traumatic trauma, one actually leaves the body and one and the mind separates from the body. And what happens to the body is not under the conscious mind and there appears to be no memory for a long time and there's a separation and this is called dissociation. 
And once the amygdala has been tripped one time because there's a trauma, there's a, a, a programming that is generated, created for survival sake. And the, and the being may look for other patterns for when this might happen again. And they want to make sure, the brain wants to make sure that they can prevent it from happening again. And they look for any kind of uh, similarity to the current situation. And that means that there, you know, there's a categorizing of what was it about this situation that caused the trauma? And, and then one looks to see, is it happening again? How do I prevent it? And sometimes one spends a lot of one's time um, trying to prevent the trigger from being tripped again. And it's, it's, it turns into like a hypervigilance of, of making sure the trauma does not happen again. And a lot of energy goes to this, um, to this um, thwarting uh, the trauma from repeating itself. And yet what we all know is in the effort to thwart the repeat, uh, one actually overcompensates often and sees sees um, situations as not uh, not as they truly are, and therefore either too sensitive or undersensitive, and that is that it means that the trauma is more likely to repeat itself, having tripped once. Now back to the window of tolerance. What the window of tolerance is, you, um, it's essentially the zone whereby one can function. The adult brain can be in charge. Picture this kind of as a horizontal section. Maybe, you know, in the middle is this wide band and in the, within that band, feelings, thoughts, body sensations occur. And yet they're all manageable. They're all reasonable. They're all, from an outside perspective, um, they look okay. And truly they are okay. Not, you know, not because they're boring, flat, you know, no feeling no thought, but rather they're okay because the adult stays in the adult mind. The cerebral cortex, which, which is the adult mind, is actually able to uh, manage the ups and downs and able to think clearly. So this all is good as long as there is no similarity to any sort of upsetting event in the present moment. So unfortunately, what happens is sometimes uh, we see something, uh, a traumatized person sees a situation that looks like a similar tra traumatic event. They could be hearing something, they could be in a setting, a location that looks like it, they could be smelling something, and suddenly the amygdala takes over. And even though the trauma happened months, years ago, it doesn't matter The um, from a, a brain perspective, the amygdala hijacks the cerebral cortex and begins to take over and and act as if they are in trauma mode once again. And, and the usual thing that happens is you go to your preferred uh, response, one you've tried before perhaps, which is either up, if, if the window of tolerance is down here, the uh, first attempt often is going up into the hyper arousal, and you can picture it as the band above the uh, window of tolerance, and that's where the fight and the flight are um, experienced. Or the person goes down below the window of tolerance into the hypo arousal, and that's where the dissociation occurs. While someone is out of their window of tolerance, there is no point in trying to talk and problem solve and think about what's what's going on and share. And so it's really difficult because uh, an individual who's out of their window of tolerance doesn't often even know they're out. They can train themselves to know when they're out. Um, and um, people will often sort of intrude on them, trying to tell them to calm themselves and they're not able to try to continue having conversations and they're talking to an amygdala, not to a cerebral cortex. And what happens is it's, it's a waste of time. There's a breach. There's no, there's no connection. And in those situations, either the traumatized person or the person who's trauma informed can recognize, ah, I think something's going on here. Let's back off. Let's take a break. Maybe it's just a minute. Maybe it's 10 minutes. 
maybe it's an hour or even a day or three, um, can be useful sometimes for an individual to calm back down, let the amygdala um, calm itself, reverse uh, the brains, and allow the individual to be to return to their uh, window of tolerance. And at that point, you can discuss what was going on, what happened, where'd you go, what what was what was going on in your mind. Another way to picture this, um, so I, you know, this first way I was describing was to picture it as a um, horizontal with the hyper up and the hypo down. From a healing perspective, uh, sometimes a better way to picture it as is as a ladder where the window of tolerance is at the top and someone is acting like an adult when they're speaking and um, having thoughts and feelings in the normal range and they are at the top rung of a ladder. And uh, when a traumatic event happens or there is a trigger and one is back into that um, old trauma event in the present, they may, they may try going down a level. And you picture hyper arousal as in going down a level because they are not as accessible to others when they're down um, lower. And if that doesn't work, they drop a second level down. And that second level then is the freeze where someone just does not seem to even be there. If you've ever been with someone who's in the freeze state, um, they seem checked out. They seem like they're in a cave. They seem like they are just not there. You can almost wave your hand across their face and there's no response. This is also where some of the spiritual bypassing um, appears where someone may may live in that state for years and unless you're you're aware that there's a spiritual bypassing component of it you you might miss it completely so I hope that helps explain a little bit about the trauma and the window of tolerance and how these all connect and how these all um, are important from a background perspective but let's now move over to the states of awakening so the states of awakening are what Dharma teachers often train in. And they tell us, we all read in the scriptures, that only humans can awaken. Most of you have probably heard that. And I would agree, that is absolutely true. Only a human can awaken. However, I would fine tune that and say, actually, only a human who generally stays in their window of tolerance can awaken. If a Dharma student, one who's studying awakening, regularly falls out of their window of tolerance, they actually need more therapy, not more meditation. And more meditation, in fact, may be detrimental. And so there are some meditation students, some Dharma students, for whom uh, meditation is actually um, not the best thing for them. For a time, they need more therapy to actually support the ego, build the ego, stabilize the ego, and ensure that the Dharma student can actually stay in their window of tolerance generally. There's no like, there's no exact amount for how much one needs to stay in um, their window of tolerance, but it should be for most of the time. Because even for a Dharma student who has done a lot of therapy, um, you know, something about a particular meditation practice might actually take them out of their window of tolerance. Um, I've seen this happen time and time again in classes where some somebody will say something this happens a lot when there's vajrayana students and there's conversations and there's there's integration into everyday life sometimes the teacher will say things um it's you know it's very common that classes and meditation practices take students dharma students um, out of their window of tolerance and dharma teachers really need to be trauma informed and to recognize to recognize when students are not just being lazy, are not just um, ignoring you, floating. However you, however you see it as a Dharma, Dharma teacher, you may perceive that, the, that there's resistance happening. But resistance can only happen when the cerebral cortex is engaged. If someone is actually out of their window of tolerance because of trauma, then it's not a choice. Uh, they're they're actually not able to engage in whatever meditation um, practice you're you're working with them on. This happens a lot, um, you know, for regular students when they're on their own, doing their own daily practice. Um, could also happen when you have students that are in retreat because retreats notoriously dig up stuff. 
um, they can go into, you know, students can go into past lives that can be traumatizing. Students can uh, remember things in meditation that they might not have remembered um, in their uh, waking state. And that's because some of the meditation practices have some commonality with uh, healing practices. And it can be deeply healing to be sitting in meditation for extended periods of time. And yet while it's while the pot potential is there, it can also be extremely traumatizing if a teacher isn't ready to uh, support the student who actually might fall out of their window of tolerance and be be um, not able, like not have enough foundation to support what's happening for them. It's also really important that Dharma centers uh, have structures in place to handle students with trauma. And in fact, most of us have 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 had some kind of trauma in our lifetimes. It might be small t trauma, it might, which is sort of um, the socializing of, of being uh, raised, being parented, could be um, just forming an identity and you know stepping outside of your uh, your cultural um, um, support for that. So there's that's what we might call the small t trauma, where you're upset and yet have you know literally go into your uh, amygdala for a time. And we also have big T trauma, which is really the um, the more classic um, uh, trauma that you might think of in the form of either physical or sexual abuse, neglect, um, could be also um, uh, domestic violence, um, child abuse, physical, physical abuse. Um, these are all what we might think of as big T trauma. And surprisingly enough, a lot of Dharma students have both and um, like all humans, we, we have, there's a lot more abuse and a lot more trauma in the world. And um, so it's important that we, that we recognize what happens when someone is traumatized. And it's Dharma centers, I believe, are responsible to support this because when one supports the, the traumatized student, they're actually able to get more out of the meditation practices. So from my perspective, uh, it would be beneficial for a Dharma center to ask questions in advance about um, uh, psychological uh, trauma backgrounds. Um, they should also encourage staff to check in with anyone who has reported that there are that there's a history of some kind of trauma uh, in the past. It's not okay to just ask questions. One must actually then figure out what to do with those answers. And the check-in by staff is one way that you do something with it. Uh, staff should also share this with the history with teachers and make sure that there's a plan for this individual that th the individual um, supports and finds uh, so encouraging and supportive and not, and not um, stigmatizing, not pointing them out, not making a big deal of it but at the same time, a plan that the student is comfortable with. Um, and, and, and have a list of options that the center might offer to uh, trauma uh, students with history of traumas. And there's a variety of these um, ideas. Hopefully, this is just the beginning of a conversation around these ideas, and there might be more that um, Dharma centers can share with each other about what students have found helpful and supportive. But I imagine some of them might be... Um, uh, permission to eat alone rather than with the group. Um, something about eating can be quite um, triggering for many people. So just having having permission to go to a quiet place with a little bit less stimulation. Could be also um, uh, arrangements with teachers to make sure that they're willing to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with any student who has something come up during during a meeting, during, during a meditation, during a retreat. Uh, Students may need permission to not participate in some activities, either after they've been traumatized to be able to calm back down, to get back in their window of tolerance, to return to the group. Could be also um, if they know in advance that what they hear is about to happen is going to be traumatizing to give them permission to say, um, I can't handle this. Um, it this activity will put me out of my window of tolerance I, and I need to, um, I need permission to say, I can't do this. Um, there's different positions students find supportive when in the temple together that some people can sit uh, still quietly on the floor on cushions. Others need to uh, lie down. Some need to move. Some need to be able to change it up uh, depending on what they need. So simply having some uh, sort of basic understandings that that's okay no matter who the teacher is and what the practice is. 
and more than anything, um, checking in with students to find out what would they find supportive if they have specific coping strategies that they like. Maybe they hold something in their hands. Maybe they, um, you know, want to be able to reach out to someone, even though there's a no cell phone policy, they need, they want to reach out to a particular support. So these are only just ideas. I think we're only beginning to, to get started thinking about what uh, trauma-informed Dharma looks like. Uh, but I hope that this uh, YouTube video begins to um, make you interested, make you curious about how uh, trauma and Dharma interact, how they can support each other, and more than anything, to commit to the healing that when healing happens for Dharma students in the stages category, it will allow them to actually um, uh, meditate better and to become better Dharma students if we support their uh, trauma healing as well.